have you implemented conditional access? Because if so, you probably come to terms with the fact that it's full of quirks and features. In this video, we're going to cover the top five common mistakes that we see in conditional access in the security assessments that we perform as Microsoft Ireland Security Partner of the Year. All right, so the first mistake that we're going to look at is this idea that exclusions and access gaps, they're not minimized by additional policies. One of the things that's always true in security is you're never going to have absolutes. You'll always have exclusions based on edge cases and things like that. With conditional access, we want to really even protect our exclusions. So let me show you what I mean by that. I got my full list of policies here and I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to find one that's quite common. Let's say this one here. So this is targeting my admin users and it's basically saying if you are an admin, then we are going to block access unless you are on a compliant device. Kind of straightforward, right? We want to make sure our admins are on secure corporate devices. There will be occasions where a policy like this you have to bypass. So for example, let's say I'm an admin and I need to log into a server. For example, the Windows Defender Vulnerability Management Scanner, you might want to log into that server. Well, that server can never be compliant. Therefore, you just cannot log in. So you want an exclusion. Well, how can we manage that exclusion in a secure way? The insecure way would be for me to go into this policy, hit exclude, and then just add in that admin user there. What we can alternatively do is layer a few capabilities of Entra on top of that to manage it more effectively. You'll see here in my example, I'm excluding a group, and that group is called exclusion device state. Gonna head back up to my full list of policies. If I scroll down, you'll see I have a supplementary policy that says for that group that was excluded from requiring a compliant device, we're going to include that group in this policy. And this policy then says, okay, you can authenticate without a compliant device, but you have to be doing so from a trusted IP address. So the effect here is we're basically saying, okay, well, you don't have to use a compliant device, but you have to have some kind of mitigation in place. So for example, you have to be connecting from our data center or our office or something like that. And then to take things a little bit further, we can also apply just in time access to this exclusion. So that group, if we head over an entry, let's head to identity governance. We're going to go into privileged identity management. We'll go to groups. And what we can do is we can add that group here. This means that the user activates membership of the exclusion group for just the time they need. So I'm only going to be a member of that group for say five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour I think is actually the minimum, two hours, so on and so forth. So that I'm automatically removed from that group after the time period and that security exclusion, it just tidies itself up automatically. So again, to summarize on that one, we always want to have supplementary policies to any exclusions we've got in conditional access. Next up, our second common mistake that we're going to cover is that our location-based policies don't consider VPNs. Very common in conditional access to have a policy that will restrict authentication and authorization to locations that we only do business in. So for example, let's head to named locations on the left here. And let's look at this one here called internals approved countries. So in this example, got a little save here, you can see United Kingdom is ticked. So if I only do business, for example, in the United Kingdom or Ireland, tick those and then block every other location. It's kind of low hanging fruit, right? However, this named location in itself and the policy that enforces it, which we'll head to now, let's go to unapproved locations blocked. This policy here, which blocks access to any locations other than those. This doesn't account for consumer-based VPN services or even VMs in places like Azure or AWS. So how can we even protect against those VPNs where you know user fires up their consumer VPN to bypass that? Well, what we can do is head back to create a new policy. And in this policy, we would configure it, choose the right scope. We would want to use conditional access app control, and then we'd want to use a custom policy. So what is this? Conditional Access App Control uses Defender for cloud apps. And it basically says, after Conditional Access has done its thing, I'm going to hand over to Defender for cloud apps to then enforce additional policy. I'm going to choose to configure a custom policy. This is going to pivot me over to security.microsoft.com, also called the Defender Portal, also called the Security Center. I'm going to take a minute to load that there. Defender for cloud apps loads, and I'm in the Conditional Access tab of my policies. I'll choose to create a policy, and I'm going to choose an access policy. I'll give it a name here. We'll just punch in test. And this is where we get more refined capabilities over locations. 
So for example, let's uh, clear our filter. And in select filter, I'm going to go down to IP address. And I've got a few options here. If I choose category, you'll see, for example, I could say cloud provider or VPN. I may also want to choose risky, things like that. But let's just focus here. We're, we're talking about location bypasses. So cloud provider, that's going to scoop up things like Azure virtual machines and VPNs as well. That's going to do what it says on the tin. I can choose block. I could enter a custom message if I wanted. And I can also choose alerts or not. Let's disable those. And let's create that. And so now what's going to happen is that conditional access policy it hands over to Defender for Cloud Apps. Defender for Cloud Apps has this policy and scope, and it says, well, you know what? If you're signing in from an IP address that matches the two things you selected, we're going to block that sign-in. So again, it's just about fully understanding the scope of things and protecting against those. Let's head back to the entry portal now and cover that third common mistake. I'm going to head into one policy I've got here to explain this one. We'll go to Users, and we'll go to Exclude. You'll see here, this is the first thing I do whenever I'm creating any conditional access policy is I include what we call emergency access accounts. There's a lot of different ways you can manage emergency access accounts. The big mistake is that you're not using them all together, right? So what is an emergency access account? Well, think about it. Conditional access is kind of a high risk tool to get wrong. You could very easily create a policy that takes all your users, takes all the circumstances around them signing in, and then you say block access. And all of a sudden, every user in your environment, including you as an administrator, is blocked access. And you're going to go, have to go through a long process of trying to get access back in there. To mitigate against that risk, we have the concept of emergency access accounts. An emergency access account, really under Microsoft's best practices, is an account that is a, an assigned and consistent global administrator that is then excluded from every policy. That introduces a new risk, right? So if I have all these conditional access policies and I've excluded my emergency access account just in case, well, how do I protect those emergency access accounts, right? Because they all of a sudden, if they've got global admin rights, they're a significant threat. Well, first off, uh, what you may want to consider, this is all based on your risk tolerance and the kind of things you want to protect against. You may want to consider conditional access policies that just target those emergency access accounts. So for example, one of the things I commonly do is I'll have two different emergency access accounts, and then I'll have policies that target just those accounts. So for example, if I go into this one here, let's go to the assigned users. We're targeting my break glass account. And if I go into the requirements for that, well, I'm saying actually in order to sign into my break glass account, I need to use a pass key or a 502 key, something like that. So it's excluded from all other policies that might accidentally lock me out. But then if I do need to smash the glass, get access, well, I'm still going to need that 502 key. And then for my second one, what I may want to do is have a different requirement. So maybe I don't need a 502 key, but I do need to sign in from a known location. And that way, I can try emergency access account number one. And then if that doesn't work, I can emergency access account number two. And you just got to make sure that you secure those accounts credentials the same way you would secure any other global admin permissions, if not more. So for example, there's uh, some use cases where folks will take that big random password they've assigned this account, and they will literally cut it in half and store those two halves of the password physically in different locations. It's all about choosing your risk appetite, balancing that requirement of needing, oh no, everything's broken, I need access ASAP versus some kind of security. Point being for this mistake, we're talking about just having these in the first place. Then you may also want to consider things like service principles as an option for managing them rather than standard user objects. Fourth common mistake we often see is protecting those conditional access groups, right? So, so far we've already identified that emergency access accounts are really important to protect. There will also be other conditional access groups that are important to protect. So for example, if you've got a conditional access group that has all your administrators and all the policies they need to adhere to, you've got to keep that group safe from unwanted tampering. Well, one of the things to be aware of is that by default, if you just create a security group, there's no protections around it from things like the user administrator role, right? They could jump in there and they could add themselves to that group or even remove folks from that group. So there's a few things we might want to consider that protects the group. I'll run you through those. Let's head to our list of groups in this demo environment. And we're going to go into our admins. We'll go to members. So we can see a whole bunch of admin accounts. I'm going to go to the properties of this group. And I'll call out this one down here. Enter roles can be assigned to this group. And we've said yes. So enter roles, well, they're admin roles, right? I actually don't have to assign any roles to it. So for example, if I go to assigned roles, you'll see here there's, there's nothing assigned. But the point of ticking that box is that it elevates the level of security required. So now 
to modify this group, I need to have highly privileged rights. I need to be global admin, privileged role admin, something like that. So a standard user admin cannot tamper with this group now. Now there's one other layer of protection I might want to consider. I'm going to stumble about trying to find it here, but if I go to expand this, I think I need to go to roles and admins, and we're going to go into admin units. So admin units are kind of logical containers for users, groups, devices, and they basically limit who can be an administrator of those resources. There's a new type of admin unit called a restricted management admin unit, and that's going to protect even global admins from touching anything I put in there. So you'll see here, I put in my two emergency access accounts, and I've also put in my emergency access group. So even if I'm a global admin, by standard, I cannot go in and do things like change those passwords or change the membership of those groups. You have to look at these admin units as more of a more of a safety barrier than a real security boundary, because the global admin would have permission to actually remove the admin unit. But the point is, it just stops you accidentally making any mistakes, right? And it adds another hoop I have to jump through, maybe something that you set some kind of alerting and monitoring on. So we want to protect those sensitive groups. We can do that using the role assignment feature or administrative units. Really, the fifth thing, which I'll cover as a common mistake, and it's almost an all-encompassing mistake, is the lack of using a proper framework and really consistently thinking about how your policies are going to scale. I'm going to head back to the protection settings and then go into conditional access. I'll expand my policies here. Now you'll see here in this environment, I get 73 policies. That's a lot of stuff, right? And a lot of times the knee-jerk response to seeing that number of policies is, wow, that looks unmanageable, maybe a little bit intimidating. You know, how do you scale that? Well, let me talk you through how we have reached the decision to have that kind of number of policies. You'll see, although there's a lot here, they've all got a very consistent naming convention. We have this concept of the persona, global, admins, internals, externals, and those personas all correspond to the types of security we want a user or group to have. So for example, my admins, more secure, my internal users, standard level of security, my guests, a different level of security again. This is called what we're looking at now, the Conditional Access for Zero Trust Framework. It was developed by Klaus Jesperson, who's recently retired from Microsoft. But what it introduces is this scalable framework so you can identify use cases and then design conditional access to accommodate those use cases. Where it really targets the weaknesses of conditional access is that exclusion management principle. So I go back to this point about how we've got a lot of policies here. Well, the reason we have a lot of policies is it allows us to be very specific with regards to exclusion management. So if I go to new policy up the top here, what may be common to see is in a conditional access policy, we're going to require MFA. We're also going to require the device to be compliant. We're maybe going to require folks to accept terms of use. And we're also going to require a hybrid joint device. That's four security requirements for someone to sign in. Well, if someone needs a security exclusion, to just one of those, in this policy where I've selected all four, I would actually have to exclude them from all four rather than just the one, right? Using the CAS-T framework, what we prefer to do is have specific policies that really go as low as possible. Conditional access does have limits about the number of policies you can have, but for all intents and purposes, we don't need to worry too much about them. And so with a framework like this, it just makes it far more scalable for exclusion management and then every different types of personas we may have. So those are our five big mistakes to avoid in conditional access. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to us for more upcoming conditional access guidance, including steps on how you can go a bit more in depth and protect against some of these threats. And YouTube also thinks you'll like this video. So check that out.